Well, good morning, Chestnut Ridge Baptist Church. We're here today with our Sunday School lesson. Um, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is prioritizing meeting people's needs over keeping religion, um, keeping not re only religions, but rituals. Um, so we're going to be talking about traditions. And if you've noticed on Facebook, I put on, the, I put on there this morning the song Traditions from um, Fiddler on the Roof. That was one of my favorite songs, um, and it was just a, a great, fun time to, that's a wonderful movie. Okay, so um, how do we react when our routine is interrupted? <laughs> you laugh. That is serious. Me too. How dare you interrupt me? Absolutely, I do the same thing. Oh my gosh, when I have this set routine that I like to keep everything, you know, nice and order um, in the morning, I like to make sure I get up and I, I do stuff in a certain manner and don't get in my way. <laughs> don't bother me. Um, Pat and I actually, you know, have our own routines. He likes to sit when it's, he likes to sit and meditate on the Lord in the dark. Me, I'm a light person, and so I have to have every single light on in the house. And so I turn all the lights on, and he walks behind me, and he'll turn them off. Um, you know, but it works really well for us because I sit in my room, and I get to have my time with the Lord, and he sits in his room, and he has his time with the Lord, and ne'er shall the two meet. <laughs> but, but if we get interrupted, I do the same thing. I get very frustrated. Well, today we're going to look at how Jesus is kind of interrupting the traditions of the Pharisees and you know as we're looking at today being Valentine's Day God's gift to us the greatest Valentine we could have ever had is Jesus and when God gave Jesus to us as a sacrifice he sacrificed his son so that we could live what a wonderful sacrifice that is that we have um, and so you know as we look at who Jesus is today and even, you know, as we go into Lent, this week starts Lent. And as we go into looking at Lent, you know, being able to really understand exactly what Jesus did for us and, and why. Why did he die on the cross for us? Um, you know, so my, and I, and so Jesus is kind of going to interrupt the Pharisees and kind of change their thinking. And so um, one of the things that I wrote down on my own, for my own self is like, okay, so my dedication to my routine is, it, dedication to a routine is not always bad. However, when we get to the point where it becomes our routine or our ritual or our tradition becomes more important than our relationship with the Lord, that's when it becomes a problem. You know, so all that I've learned, even, you know, as a Lord, um, in, in being able to follow my rituals. So in that instance, having the rituals or the traditions, it was good because it helped to build in me a good discipline. But we're going to see where in the Pharisees' lives, it became more important, the ritual, the tradition, which is why I did the song, um, they became more important than the relationship. And so we get to look at the relationship. You know, last week we talked about how Jesus accused the Pharisees. What were the Pharisees? The Pharisees were right there and they were there to accuse Jesus without cause. They were searching and looking for something, looking for faults in him. Well, we know that Jesus had no sin, so they couldn't find anything wrong with him. But they kept accusing him and they kept looking for him and they kept looking to try to identify what was wrong Okay, what did he do wrong? And so they went in with this eagle eye, searching out, trying to uh, make accusations against him. Kind of sounds a little bit like today, I hear. I, it reminded me a bit of today. Um, but Jesus, they could, not they could not deny his power. And even at the end of our, la our lesson last week, he talked about how Jesus said, I have come to forgive sins. And so, you know, we see that that they really came against that. Why? Well, we have the Pharisees who are, you know, this self-righteous, you know, all, you know, I am, I'm the law. 
The Pharisees were considered the lawmakers. They were considered those people. They were the spiritual law leaders. And they believed that you had to follow the book of the law every dot and tittle. And so you had to make sure you washed your hands. Like in traditions, he said, you have to make sure you wash your hands in a proper way. And how you walk. Because where you walk, on the side of the street that you walk on, when you pray, whether you cover your head, and their, their rituals and traditions that they had set up were by the thousands. But Jesus is going to look beyond all of that. Um, and so at the very first verse, what does it say? And so we are in um, Luke 6, 1 and 2. Go ahead. It's Luke 5. Luke 5? Oh, you're right. <laughs> um, one of those days while he was teaching, Pharisees... Oh, wait. Did I do the wrong lesson? Uh, I don't know. Am I in the right? Um, 6 1. On the Sabbath is where we're starting. Oh, wait. It kind of covers, I think we're going to kind of go backwards, but it is starts with 6 1 on the Sabbath. You want 6 1? Yes, ma'am. It's not in the, it's not in the Sunday school book. Or do we have? Luke? Yeah. Luke, and it says 517. We should be in lesson 11. We did 517 last week. Let me see. Lesson 11. Mm -hmm. well, Good morning, Donna and Pauline. We're glad to have you okay. here with us. We're in lesson. Okay. okay, we're in lesson 11. <laughs> That's what we're going to do today. I we're did, I didn't turn my book last week and I always had a mark. Oh, there you go. That's, I understand. <laughs> I was reading it, but familiar, but okay. Um, so we're talking about working on the Sabbath. We're going to find out where that came, comes in. Okay, so chapters, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. We'll just read one first. On a Sabbath, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Okay. So the Sabbath was the seventh day. And we know that in Genesis, God, um, when he created the heavens and the earth, on the seventh day, he rested. And so that was our guide. That as, G as Father God rested on the seventh day, so should we. And so then in Exodus, you know, they talk about remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And actually, that was one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And so that's where all of this is stemming from. That's the underlying um, law that's in there. Good morning, Karen. I'm glad you're here with us. Um, older people study won't do anything on Sunday. Either. Right. And so Sunday, is a, it's a holy day. Um, and so those rituals and those laws, I remember when we first came to Ohio, there was nothing open on Sunday. Nothing was open on Sunday. Um, and then, you know, slowly things started changing. But we still should keep it, it. That's a command to keep it holy. Now, does that mean that we, you know, some people will say you can't even cook on Sunday. Right. Um, you cook everything on the day before and then you just heat everything up. But I think that there has to be that balance. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today is what is that balance? Well, as Jesus came in, He's going to look beyond the letter of the law because when you go into this, it's looking at the traditions or the, the ritual that the, the Pharisees had had. And he's going, Jesus is saying, no, there's more to it. They, we, he's going to look at the heart. Whereas here, he, here are those Pharisees and what are they doing? They're looking ways to, to accuse him. They're following him. You know, he's right now, Jesus is out and he was with his, with his followers because that's what it says. He went out with his disciples 
But they, but the Pharisees were there watching. Kind of, I can kind of get this picture of them going like this. What's he doing now? Where is he? I got my. Oh, oh my gosh! Oh my goodness! He's going by the. Oh my goodness! He's going to pick the grain. He's he's in the woods. He's in the grass. He's going to pick the grain. Oh my goodness! You know, just to try to disqualify him from being who he is, and and you know when we think about that to look for something that they were complaining about. How often do we see, or do we in our, you know, our flesh rises up. <laughs> our flesh rises up. And sometimes then that flesh rises up. We look for things to complain about. We don't necessarily look for them on purpose, but sometimes to make ourselves feel better, it's easier to criticize than to be kind. And so I think Jesus is kind of going back and he's looking at the Pharisees. The Pharisees were hypocritical. They had all these things that they had to do. They were the priests. They were the high priests in the Jewish in the Jewish religion. And they had to make sure that, and they did. They prayed every, you know, every uh, four times a day. And um, they did all those things. But their hearts were far from that. And we still live in a hypocritical world. We do live in a hypocritical world. And, and what is your first thing when you think of a hypocritical world? I'm glad you said that because I thought of that too. You, I bet you have all thought of that too. Well, if you don't believe the way I believe, it's wrong. Exactly. If you don't believe just like me, then it's wrong. Yeah. Um, every, and, and you have to be my religion. If you're not my religion, then, then that's something wrong. How about going to church on Sunday morning and living you know, this perfect little coming into church, all perfect and, and proper and, but then walking out the door and blah, 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 and right. you know, you forget everything you got, you've done and you don't open your Bible up for the whole rest of the week until the next Sunday morning. Well, that's exactly doing what the Pharisees are doing. That's that hypocritical spirit. And so Jesus is going to be looking at what is the intent. Um, and so in verse three, Jesus looked beyond. He says, Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he entered the with his companions? He entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what was lawful for only the priests to eat. And he also gave some of it to his companions. Okay, so let's take that apart. <clears throat> So we have all these traditions and they had all these traditions as well. And David, David was a man after God's own heart and they knew it. They knew that David was that. David was, he's the writer of Psalms. And so Jesus is questioning. He's trying to get them back into where they can understand and they can, you know, kind of relate. And they're saying, look, Dan don't you remember Daniel? I'm not Daniel, but don't you remember that David who is a man after God's own heart, went into it and he ate from the, he ate the consecrated bread. You know, and um, at that point when they're talking about that, David actually had been um, being chased. That was when he and Jonathan went out and Jonathan said his, Saul was ready to kill him. And so he was trying to hide. And so he had gone out into the desert to hide from the, from the men who wanted to kill him, which was Saul, and David, they were starving. And so David went into the temple and he, he went to Nob or Nob and to seek. Well, why did he go to Nob? He went to Nob to seek God's guidance and to understand that Nob, where he went, it was the place of Ur. And that was a, pl a place that was designated to God. It was a sacred place. And so when Dave, when David did that, he went to under to, he went to see what God wanted of him to do. He wanted to know how he could serve God better. And so in doing that, he let go of his because these were his rituals and his traditions as well. And so when he let go of those, and he felt like he needed to have the um, he needed to have that food. And so he asked the priest and the priest, long story short, and, um, and I think that's in, that is in Leviticus. And so long story short, he was given that food to eat. And it's interesting to me that Jesus 
goes back and references that because he's saying, okay, this is the precedence that has been set. David is a man after God's own heart. He loves the Lord. And yet God met his physical needs through the consecrated bread. Sometimes you have to let go of the traditions and serve me and to follow me and to see what I'm going to do because I'm going to, I'm going to give you what you need. Often those physical needs are greater than the legalistic prohibitions that were there and that were legal. That, and that's why Jesus was telling, um, telling that. And so Jesus kind of wanted to say, look, this is what's going on. But why would Jesus do that? What do you think the purpose for it was? <clears throat> I lost you because my mind was... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I kind of rambled there a bit. Um, why do you think Jesus told the, the, um, the Pharisees this story about David? Why did he relate that to them? Yes, exactly. And then Jesus does go on to say, and if you read in verse 5, I'm sorry. Um, now, yes, so verse 5. Another, now, oh, or verse 6. Verse 5, please. Um, verse 5. Yes. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, I'm over all the rules. I'm over all the rituals. I'm over all of these things. Um, and when we understand that God, Jesus, is over all of our traditions, it kind of, I had to, I had to stop and think. I wonder if sometimes when we go to church on Sunday morning, if we don't make him sad, when we're supposed to be coming to church and we're supposed to not only be, you know, coming to church, but if we just come to church and we just are just doing, okay, I'm here. I'm not going to listen, but I'm here. I'm, I'm sitting in the pew because that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't think that really makes the Lord very happy. Or, or when we just sit and we just sit because we've had a bad morning. We've all done that. You know, we come in, we've had a bad day, it's it's difficult, we've been tired, exhausted, had a bad night's sleep. There, there we go. Um, that's me all the time. On Sunday, it seems like Saturday night's like the worst night of all to sleep. Um, miracle dark circles today. But, um, you know, if we come in and we don't, it's unto I the Lord. A word or two out. That's, that's I understand. But yeah, and sometimes that happens too, and that's okay. But as long as our heart is there, and because that's what Jesus is looking for, He's looking for the heart, and He's because He's saying, "I, I am the Lord of the Sabbath." That means I'm over the Sabbath. I'm over church. I am. You know, Jesus is church. <laughs> really, it's not this building. No. It's not the building. You, that's not going to save us. It's that relationship with Jesus Christ in our hearts because he is our savior. That's what's going to make us. <clears throat> and so, which is interesting, you know, as we continue on, because we're going to see that even though Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, the next verse, what does it say? On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. <clears throat> A man was there just maintaining um, a time to go to church. He's saying there's much more than that. And so what he's showing is here he comes in and there was a man whose hand was shriveled, who needed to be healed. Now, according to the traditional law of the Jews, you did not heal on the Sabbath. That was just something that was one of the one of the criteria you did not do. You do not heal on the Sabbath. Why not? That was one of the things I would have thought they would have <clears throat> I know. I know. But somehow it, it had been misconstrued. How often do we misconstrue things? You're not really working. No. You're praying for somebody. Exactly. To heal. 
Exactly. And so I don't understand why they had that as a rule. Um, but the same thing was when Jesus was picking the grain. He wasn't allowed to. That's right. He wouldn't have been working. That's right. But in their eyes, when you did that, you, you were working. And so you're not allowed. And so, but that's what they were doing. They were, see, they were searching out for these little tiny um, discrepancies of what he is not following. Oh, oh, look, Jesus did not follow this rule right here. This is the rule. This is, whose rule is it? It's man's rule. It's not God's rule. It's not in the word of God. It doesn't say that we're not supposed to do that. It says honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. But that's far different. And so here we have, again, we have the Pharisees who are, what were they doing? They were spying. They, <laughs> they were, they were spying. Looking for reasons to accuse Jesus is what it says in the NIV. They were watching him closely, searching out, you know, kind of being a detective. They were spying, trying to figure out what can we, what can we say he did? How can we twist what he's doing? How can we criticize him? How can we find sin? We're going to find some sin. This man has to have sin because he he calls himself God. Well, in their eyes, that was blasphemy. And they, because they didn't see. They had, um, what are those old they, blinders. blinders. They had blinders over there, you know, like a horse has their blinders on it so it doesn't get distracted. You know, sometimes we need those blinders to, so we don't get distracted. But they had blinders on their eyes so that they didn't see the truth. And that's such a sad place to be is, you know, when they, they don't see the truth. And then not only did they not see the truth that Jesus was talking about, but then it goes on to say that in verse 8 and 9. But he knew their thoughts and told the man with the shriveled hands, get up and stand here. So he got up and stood there. Then okay, Jesus we're going to stop right there. Okay, okay so in that is verse 8. So in verse 8, Jesus is seeing what's going on. He knows their heart. He knows they're looking for something to tell. This is on the Sabbath. He knows he's, that they're looking for something to, because he, that he can do. Um, and so Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Okay, if I'm not allowed to, um, if I, I see this man with a shriveled hand. And then Jesus says, but he knew what they were thinking. And he says, get up. And he stood up in front of everyone. And so he got up and he stood there. Well, Jesus began to heal him. But because of that reaction, they were angry. The people got angry. And you're going, oh, wait a minute. The life of this person is not important. But your anger at following the rule is more important. Somehow that that hit a real spark in me because I'm going, wait a second. Here the, here's Jesus and he said, stand, go, get up, get up and stand here. So the man did. The man got up and he stood. He followed Jesus. So he was obedient. That, again, that isn't what I would classify as work. It's and not. He only spoke. Exactly. He only spoke. But what did he speak? He spoke the word of God because who is Jesus? But Jesus is the word of God right. and he's the truth. And when he spoke the truth, the dark doesn't like the truth. And so evil came up against him. Um, and so he got up and he stood there. Jesus turned his attention to the religious leaders. And I just want to read this, how they put this in here. He says, they wanted to use this opportunity to trap Jesus. If he healed the man, they would charge with, with him, they would charge him with profaning on the Sabbath. I'm sure how that is, but that was one of their rules. But on the other hand, if he did not help the man, they would accuse him of a lack of compassion. And so Jesus' words, so Jesus knew that they were looking for, they tried to set up a no-win scenario for Jesus. But Jesus knew that because he saw their heart. They didn't know that. They didn't know that he could see in. 
And so Jesus asked them, he went on to them and he says, okay, let me ask you this. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? Oh my gosh. That verse speaks volumes to, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? Is it lawful to save life or to destroy it? Either one of those answers, it's going to put the, it puts it right back on the Pharisees and it identifies that the Pharisees really have no compassion for the people. No compassion for the people at all. Not whatsoever at all. You know what just went through my mind? <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but what if a woman was having her baby? What are they going to do? That's right. You can't have a baby. No. No, because that's work. <laughs> you can't help deliver that baby because that would be work. That's exactly right. And, and that's how ludicrous this really is. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to say is, no, come on, pay attention. This is your, your thinking, your thought processes of this is, it's misconstrued. You know, we do good, doing good on the Sabbath is a good thing. Um, you know, sometimes we do need to do that. Now it's when it, we'll talk a bit more, but it's when we change over and it becomes more important um, than that. Um, And so <laughs> here he is. Okay, so he gets up and he says, Jesus looked at the heart. And he says, so is it better to save a life or to destroy a life? And, you know, with the abortion issue, that kind of made me think of that, mm -hmm. you know, because what are we going to do? Are we going to save the lives of the baby for our, or are we going to destroy it because of convenience? And I know I probably shouldn't touch on that, but you know, that's what Jesus is looking at. He is looking at the heart so many times. He's looking at the heart. Hey, Catherine, I'm so glad you came in. Yay. Good to have you with us. Um, so Jesus is looking at that. He, he's looking around at all of them. And he told the, he told the paralytic or the man with his the wrinkled hand, the shriveled up hand. He said, stretch out your hand. Again, by just stretching out your hand, two things. Number one, by Jesus saying that, that was against the rules, the traditions. And then by the man stretching out his hand, that was considered some kind of a work process. So he wasn't allowed to do that. Jesus healed his hand because he followed directions. They were just as guilty because they were following him around. Like, yeah, absolutely. They were just as guilty, but, but their guilt doesn't count. <laughs> their guilt didn't count. Only what they could try to blame on Jesus. And so you see that um, his hand was restored. His hand was restored. Looking around at them. So he is looking at all of them. And, I, and even though Jesus is directing this at the man with the shriveled hand, he's looking at the congregation. He's looking at all the people that had followed him there. And he said, stretch out your hand. And so he did so. And his hand was completely restored. What happened when Jesus healed that man? They, however, were filled with rage and started discussing with one another what they might do to Jesus. Their hearts at that point were so cold and so um, filled with resentment and jealousy and all kinds of evil things that they were looking for a way to kind of hang Jesus. They were looking for any, any kind of blame that they could put on him none of it was true none of it was true but they did it and and um the niv it says but they were not only angry but they were furious 
and began to discuss with one another what they were going to do with Jesus. They were so filled with rage and that the word that they use there means that their rage, um, it's translated without thought. They had no thought. They had lost their minds with anger. Wow. To loot because you, because they, the truth, Jesus is the truth. And when they were filled with anger at his truth, you know, the truth identifies the darkness. And when that darkness is identified, darkness gets angry. Evil gets angry. And so, you know, they started trying to come up with more ways that they can um, slide them into some more guilt and more ways that they could try to figure out how they can blame Jesus, how they can take him out. What else can they do? How can we stop this man from spreading in their idea, in their mind, in the Pharisees and the scribes' mind, in the Sadducees? They believed Jesus was not telling the truth. And here he was, the truth. Jesus, and that's what it says. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the light. And his just embodiment of who he was brought so much conviction on the Pharisees that they wanted to put him to death. So what do we do with this this week? What do we do with it? Yeah. How can we take this into our own self this week? Maybe not be critical. And That's a good one, not to be critical of others. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have a tendency to do that. We do indeed. They don't believe as we believe. Yes, yes. To have compassion. The Pharisees had no compassion for those that were hurting, right, yeah. for those who needed healing. And we need to have that compassion. Um, absolutely. Just walk closer to God. Amen. To walk closer to him. And I think that, you know, my, my Catholic tradition is with Lent. And I actually cherish the Lent time. It's 40 days before Easter. Um, and because I use that as a time, and it's a time of fasting. Um, so you don't have to fast food. You can. Um, I, there have been times where I know people who have fasted television or, you know, coffee or anything. You know, they're just something that helps you to remember to keep your mind on the Lord. And as you do that, you just draw closer to him and not, not because that's what the, that's because of what the church says, because that would be doing like the Pharisees. But if we do it like David did, where he was searching for the Lord, he went to earth because that was the sacred place. He wanted to know more of who God was and more of what he, what it's all about is knowing who, is um, who Jesus is. And if we can just really look at who Jesus is as we get into um, the Lenten season, that's what I want. Because, you know, we're in a society today, we're in a world that hope is being lost. You know, there's, it seems like there's less and less hope anywhere to be found. And things are getting more and more evil. And, you know, we can't look at the world because Jesus is our hope. He is our salvation. He is our life. And that's all that we have. And, you know, as we do that, um, as today is Valentine's Day, thank you, Jesus, that he died on the cross for our sins. I think it's fun that Valentine's Day is red. And I think of the blood that Jesus Christ died and shed for us. Because we have, I put my red jacket on today. I don't always wear red, but because um, I feel kind of too bright in it. But I have the rope. I feel like today that now I have the robe of righteousness. I have Jesus' blood surrounding me. So when the Lord, when the Father God looks at me, he doesn't see inside my heart. He's, well, he does see inside my heart, but he doesn't see any sin that's there. He only sees me as cleansed in the robe of righteousness. And thank you, Jesus, for that. What a wonderful opportunity that we have that. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for this day. Jesus, Father God, thank you for the love that you have sent down from Father in the form of your son, in Jesus' son. And Lord, I pray that you would just touch hearts and minds and lives today. Lord, those who are hurting, those who have lost their hope, Father God, I pray that you would just fill their hearts with hope. Lord, sometimes Valentine's Day is a horrible day because for people that are by themselves or have lost loved ones, Lord, I pray for my, my good Oh, for Karen, Father God, I pray that you just wrap your arms of love around her. Lord, those of um, the ladies in the Sunday school class whose husbands have gone on and that are there with you in heaven, Lord, hug them for us. But Lord, wrap your arms of love around those that are hurting today, that you would just let them feel your presence. And Lord, we pray that you just help us to become all that you would want us to be. Draw us closer and closer to you. For as we draw close to you, Lord, you draw closer to us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we praise you for this day. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys, for joining us. Donna and Paula and Pauline, Karen and Catherine. I'm so glad you guys came. And anyone else that um, comes in next week, I can't wait to talk to you soon. I'm praying for you. Bye.